Разрідний бой! По розрідному бою! Я буду вам говорити на англійському. Мислим, да то більше знати від хорватсько-сербського або більше, як це зове та язик. My title is on some economic or political knots of self-management and power in the Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia. And the subtitle is Notes and Hypothesis. This is not a neat paper. Let me try to explain to you in two minutes why. And I'm afraid the explanation will be autobiographical. Um, I was born in Zagreb and in 41, my parents and I were interned by the Italian army on the island of Korchula. And in 43 to 45, uh, my mother and I, we were uh, with the partisan days in Bari, in Italy, while my father was as a doctor in the partisans. In 45, I returned to Yugoslavia. The family was reunited and became a convinced Titoist in high school. Uh, was a member of SCOI, the Young Communist League. In 1948, I became, before, before the Foreign Bureau Resolution, I became a member of the Communist Party. And all of that you can read in my memoirs, which have been published in Zagreb. And if anybody is interested, you can write me and you can get, you can get it. Um, I left in 1965. I was practically kicked out from Zagreb University. And this is also being written about. And I spent a third of a century in Canada, writing about different stuff, as you have heard. I was pensioned, but couldn't come back to Yugoslavia, but only to non-Yugoslavia, obviously there was none. Uh, before uh, I was pensioned, I was in Berlin with a uh, Humboldt Stiftung. Uh, Okay, you hear me now? Should I begin from zero? No. Okay. Uh, I was in Berlin in the 90s uh, with a Humboldt Stiftung money to write the definitive book on Brecht. And there, uh, the NATO bombing of Serbia and of Belgrade and Novi Sad found me. And I concluded that the definitive book on Brecht will have to be written by somebody else, and I will go in for political epistemology, that is to say, matters of power, violence, and so on, <coughs> since I didn't dare to write about Yugoslavia. So I wrote about the theory of this, and in the last two or three years, I have begun to write about ex-Yugoslavia. I have still not totally forgotten Brecht, if anybody is Interested in that, there is a talk called Brecht and Emotions on Monday um, at Novi Turk 2, I believe at 12, at the Primeriana Univergenos, Mala Sala Academia Nauka. Okay, the sunset of SFRY, okay, can I use the abbreviation? So the last 15, 20 years of SFRY are painful and dismal, but theoretically not interesting, except for the defining turncoat moment of the ruling classes. That's to say, when the politocracy, bureaucracy, technocracy uh, decided they would uh, better be compadres. And that, I hope you in Slovenia and my friends in Zagreb make them write their memoirs and go into archives. That's a very interesting moment, theoretically. But the rest is not. It's painful and dismal, but not interesting. Therefore, I deal with 1945 to 75, the hopeful sunrise in which I participated and the clouded middle course. Uh, you have got the handout from my paper, so I won't talk about the division, but I get into the part one, self-government and the avant-garde. And I believe a good introduction to this crucial binary opposition can be arrived at with due caution by a brief critical approach to Edward Kardec's copious writings on the subject. If you want, you can ask me in a discussion about Kardec. I have a real Haslibe relationship to him. Uh, the writings are remarkable both because of what they say and, and because of what they prudently leave out. So this is divided into Kardec on self-government and Kardec on avant-garde. And after having read this summer 
six or eight of his books. Here is my summary of his views. Self-management was a continuation and culmination of immemorial strivings of Yugoslav popular masses for self-government and deciding about themselves for themselves, which had its first proper incarnation in the Samouprava of the Narodno Oslobodilački Odbori of 1941-45. And a further quote written in 45 by Kardel. Da sudbinu naroda rešavaju demokratska predstavnička tela naroda od ozdo do gore, koja istovremeno postavljaju i kontrolišu svoje izvršne organe. Vlasti kod nas jedinstvena, ona predstavlja samo upravu novog tipa, to jest puna vlast u okviru zajedničkih interesa države. A second quote. Every true revolution of the working class is really a direct form of self-management. Our revolution was like that. The original partisan detachments were already an expression of the self-managing revolutionary wish of the people. The management of economic resources on liberated territory was another form of self-management. That's an interview in 74. Uh, without a revolution, depending on the participation and decentralized free initiatives of the widest masses of people, we would probably never have initiated the self-management later. And the final quote, <coughs> during the first years after the war, the self-managing experience of the liberation war was to a certain extent pushed into the background by more centralized forms of management. This was certainly partly an expression of political hesitation with respect to the forms of democratic participation by the masses, especially related to the great influence of Stalin's interpretation of socialist practice. But it was also, in no small way, the result of the real conditions and difficulties after the war, which demanded an exceptional centralization of effort. <coughs> Second part of the first part. Cardinal Avant-Garde, my summary of Cardinal's views. An avant-garde must exist not only to bring about the revolution, but also to take care of the common state interests, this means quote unquote, okay? or common interests of the whole society. This means, first, independence against threats from other states, second, economic development. I shall not deal in this paper, paper with the independence of Yugoslavia, except to note now that it was intertwined with all other political and economic decisions. One set of data I can give you, the percentage of national revenue, and I'm not sure that I understand Yugoslav statistics at all. Uh, so I don't know what Kardel means by national revenue. Um, the uh, statistical presuppositions of Western statistics are different. Anyway, macro, macro relationships are clear. The percentage of national revenue allocated to defense was in 1949 10.2%, in 1950, 12.3%, in 51, 14.3%, in 52, 21.5%, in 53, 54, 17.2%. In other words, every fifth or sixth dinner went to the army. And I will talk tomorrow about how Zhukov told Tito, you know, comrade, in 51 and 52, I twice planned the invasion so that we could finish it off. And Tito said, well, Hitler planned too. <laughs> so I don't have the percentages for later years, but for a long time, uh, the percentage of uh, national revenue allotted to the army was considerable. <clears throat> so the independence was always a huge pillar to be respected, except that in the later years it was kind of accepted by everybody, you didn't have to spend so much money on the army. The avant-garde itself was to begin with, and in the unquestioned common assumption of the whole party cadre, simply the Leninist Communist Party, <coughs> strongly but not fully inflected by Stalin's reinterpretation, primarily in uh, the history of uh, Historia SKPB, which as you know Tito translated in Moscow. It was supposed to concentrate all progressive forces in or around it and to be monolithic. But the shock of the 1948 attempt by Stalin to take power in Yugoslavia too 
led to a reassessment of the importance of self-deciding and self-government as well as of the Vanguard Party. The reasons were, first, genuine comradeship and democratic feelings from partisan times. Second, the very great economic difficulties resulting from Soviet bloc blockade of Yugoslavia, which created the need for the highest self-managing initiatives of the working people, and also a rash of such experiments fostered by the party in the factories. The conclusion drawn by the decisive leaders of the party about the causes of Stalinism was, and I quote the cartel here, one, the formation of any communist party which identified itself with the state and with the police apparatus. Two, the working masses had been isolated from government and separated from the execution of power. That is to say, they were not in the position in which they were in the early Soviets of 19. 17, 20. This was to be different in Yugoslavia. Thus, in early 49, a meeting of top people with Tito decided to prepare a plan for self-management in the whole of Yugoslav production. There were six months of experiences in over 1,000 enterprises, and based on them, the law on self-management was passed in June 1950. So my conclusion to part one is, beginning with the 1950s, there were theoretically and potentially two vanguard institutions and two centers of power in use of society, the Communist Party and the self-management system. Of course, practically there was one, but theoretically there was this possibility. My second part is on economic macro parameters and foreign participation. Uh, and I rely here on mainly on two <coughs> foreign people, Vladimir Bruce from Poland and then England, and uh, Susan Woodward, uh, Yugoslav specialist I know from the States. Bruce, right, they are both very good, by the way. I recommend it to anybody who wants to understand this situation. Bruce, writing in the early 70s, found four stages in Yugoslav economy organization. First is centralization up to beginning of 1950s. The second is introducing self-management and the first elements of the de decentralization up to 56. The third is extension of self-management powers to distribution of incomes earned in enterprises with the state retaining a dominant role in investment up to 65. The fourth is the 1965 reform which transferred expanded reproduction to enterprises leaving to the state, that is to say either the Federation in Belgrade or the Republic, various republics, resources for some defined general purposes. In particular, uh, the Federation had the subsidy for backward regions. <coughs> uh, Susan Woodward, from a strictly economical point of view, prefers the periodization of number one, okay, up to 50, number two, transition 50 to 57, and then number 3, 58 to 67. And since she is writing in the 90s, she adds phase 4, 68 to 78, and phase 5, 79 to 89. It's about 10 to 12 years each. The main difference li lies in the delayed effect of the political come administrative measures of 1950, 56, and 65, uh, which Bruce basis, the periodization on the juridical political measures and the Woodward on the economic implementation, which is always a year or two later. The second one is much more realistic, I think. I shall return to periodization after discussing the political conundrum of self-management versus party rule. It seems clear that after the failure of the 1965 reform, the system began falling into a tailspin. Now, this was the story by Bruce and Woodward. Here is the story by Cardell, which I take from a number of uh, his writings, but especially his paper for the Second Congress of Self-Managers of Yugoslavia in May 71. He says that, uh, on the whole, there was impressive growth of production, the social product, and again, I'm not sure I know what that is, of Yugoslavia uh, between 1950 and 70 grew three and a half times. That is on an average 7% per year. The industrial production grew more than six times, that is 10% per year. 
non-agricultural population grew from 35 to 62 percent. And the volume of production per head, 1952 to 69, that is to say the productivity, 3.7 times. Thus, productivity participated in the growth of production, uh, the, the, the part of productivity in the growth of production rose from 10% in the early 50s to 43% in 57 and to 87% between 66 and 70. That is to say the production wasn't simply taking on more people, indeed there was a growing unemployment, but it was high productivity per person. Now my comment to Kardec's story is, uh, first of all, he uses quite uncritically, as did everybody at the time in the West too, some measuring growth such as gross national product, which are quite fake as we know today. Uh, but it is clear that productivity rose within the self-management system very considerably, but also that this went at the expense of higher employment rates. In short, that unemployment grew more or less together with the productivity of those employed. There was never sufficient capital to ensure rising living standards of those employed, as well as the insertion into the self-management system of the unemployed. And I will talk more about tomorrow with some statistical data about this tomorrow. Now, Woodward's story is the following. Yugoslavia was until the 80s sustaining a very high rate of capital formation. But economic growth was correlative to foreign supplementation. One third of investment funds in the 50s and roughly the same one third of gross expenditures for capital in 70 to 75 came from the West. Branko Horvat denies this correlation. He thinks this is exaggerated, that the use of growth is mainly because of American loans and so on. Anyway, <coughs> they did come together at the same time. What the causal relationship is needs a trained economist to go into the archives and see. I don't know. After impressive growth in the 50s, recession of the 60s reflected Western business downturns and diminished lending to Yugoslavia. I'm still in Woodward, okay? Growth in the 70s, and I quote her, like that of most developing countries, was import-led. High debt service obligations by the late 70s cut directly into growth. In particular, unemployment, which is Woodward's particular interest, was officially acknowledged in 1950, and the first statistics in 1952, its rate was above 7%, which is already higher than the normal frictional unemployment when people move between professions and so on, which is around 4 to 5 percent, say the Western economists. This is normal for them. While in 85 the unemployment was uh, 15 percent, uh, it ranged between 1.5 percent in Slovenia and 30 percent in Kosovo and Macedonia. Yet the Yugoslav system was designed around community through labor where unemployment meant, meant exclusion from full membership <coughs> and many social rights. So, on the basis of all of this, Bruce Woodward Cardell, my conclusion is as follows. My periodization would be a compromise between Cardell and Woodward and go roughly like this. Number one, centralized reconstruction and state build up 45 to 50. Number two, beginnings of self-management to 57. Number three, first hesitations, some extension of self-management retaining state control of investment to 66. Number four, blockage of self-management and the rise of bureaucracy, technocracy, 66 to 78. Number, uh, this is number four, sorry. Number five, 97 to 89, implosion, as Yugoslavia increasingly became a peripheral dependency of global capitalism. By 79, Yugoslav foreign debt has in three years levitated from four and a half to 18 billion US dollars. And the political stalemate became a fertile breeding ground for secessionist tendencies on nationalist basis. <coughs> the second conclusion is uh, roughly the same as Woodward's. The main economic macro problem 
left unresolved in Yugoslavia as in the Soviet economic system was the, the source of rapid capital accumulation. Now, unless I'm wrong, and tell me then in the discussion, there I know of only three possible sources for rapid capital accumulation in a capitally or capitalistically underdeveloped country. One, exploitation of the working people, especially the peasants, which Pero Berezhensky in the 1920s called socialist primitive accumulation, named after Marx's discussion of 16th century England in capital. <coughs> Number two, exploitation of other countries by export of capital and or armed confiscations. This is normal imperial practice, Rome, etc. Number three, foreign loans, always threatening to boomerang. In other words, they are not a long-term option, but they are a short-term option. The USSR mainly functional number one. This is what all the struggles economically between uh, um, Buharin, Stalin, and a little bit of Trotsky uh, went about. Uh, who will pay for the industrialization? After 1945, it also tried some supplementation from uh, armed confiscations, etc. Uh, but it never amounted to much. And it never had the chance of three foreign loans. Lenin tried very hard in 21 to get them, giving all kinds of privileges to foreigners, and he failed. Yugoslavia functional number one and number three. Okay, that's to say socialist primitive accumulation and foreign loans. I think more on one than uh, even even Woodward, who is an extremist, thinks they relate as two to one. Okay, I think it was more. Part three, self-management versus bureaucracy. I put it into quotes because I don't like the term. Cardinal Young Workers' Council in opposition to them with my comment. In 1954, Cardinal wrote, Radnička klasa postaje u radničkim savjetima nezavisna od državno, to je podvuko, Cardinal, nezavisna od državnog administrativnog aparata, odnosno zaista u punoj meri i neposredno pretvara taj aparat u svoje sobstveno oruđe. This was in the first flash of enthusiasm, 54, okay. Quote goes on. Od kad imamo radničke savete, a na njihovoj osnovi veća proizvođača i prve začetke komune, naš sistem je počeo snažno politički da jača i mere revolucionarne državne prinude postepeno su počeli da se svode na minimalne razmjene. However, ten years later, in a speech at the 8th Congress of the League of Communists, he admitted that after 1956, Elements of the old system of economic administrative management still remained. Institutionally, they were the large taxing of enterprise accumulations and the state management of resulting investment funds. Politically, it was the powerful influence of subjective that, that's cartel, the powerful influence of subjective measures and political wishes in the distribution of these resources which made the first two possible. And in the speech at the 20th anniversary of Workers' Council in 70, Carter claimed contradictorily, to my mind, and I quote, that the CPY as a whole gave a powerful impetus and support to their introduction of the worker, Workers' Council. However, the opposition, even inside the party, was very strong, unquote. Especially, no, sorry, was very strong, especially among many who held administrative positions in the factories and in the federal and republican government administration and even some who held leading positions in the party, the trade unions, etc. Unquote. Now, most noteworthy is that Cardell's commendable frankness, nearer to Lenin than to Stalin, was accompanied by an imperfect <coughs> system of causal explanations for these subjective measures and political wishes. Uh, a very imprecise formulation, huh? which were after all stemming from a powerful and probably large sermon of CPY. No class interests are mentioned by Cardell, either of the working class and its allies, or of the opponents increasingly labeled in those years as the bureaucracy. What he diplomatically mentions are psychological aberrations, as if 
Subjects and wishes were specific only to the anonymous enemies of self-management. They're all anonymous. Never, never, never is mentioned. In Kardel's final collected works, the fifth and last volume was accordingly called Subjektivne snage u samo upravnom društvu. I have, of course, nothing against discussing subjective forces, but is, it is the ABC of both Marxism and political realism that they cannot be intervened into unless they are understood as anchored in social interests, and therefore in classes or some analogues thereof. If in the 1970s speech for Kardel the party as a whole was identical with the will of top leadership, this was unrealistic. For by the 1960s, decisions had to be, to a large measure, shared with other centers. The opposition from a good part of the party cadres, from enterprise managers to the level just before, below the highest one, the Politburo or the Executive Committee, this opposition may have waxed and waned, but it never ceased. Also noteworthy is Cardell's constant tendency shared by all the other top leaders to identify the furthest utopian horizons of a political and legal measure with its actual achievement in practice. As soon as I had made a speech and passed the law, this is as good as done. Of course, it was not. Uh, naturally, such a measure was not only just beginning to move towards those horizons, but it often moved very slowly hampered by what he later identified as strong pressure towards different horizons. The usually laudable horizon was therefore badly compromised by pretending it's already here, in the present, or at least within the hand's grasp. The rectificatory acknowledgement six or twelve years later that the horizon needs a further set of measures were commendable, but became something of a less and less believable ritual. Now, Cardell on bureaucracy and class, with my comments. Cardell first focused on identification of societal opposition to workers' council in his 67 article Radnička klasa, Bürokratizam i Savjez Komuniste Jugoslavije. That is to say, at the point when the resistances to the supposedly decisive reform of 65 became a key political factor. This article again maneuvers between frankness and refusal of class struggle. On the one hand, in a remarkably frank and clear formulation, he says, Birokratia je zakonita pojava kad je revolucija slomila buržoaziju, a radnička klasa je isuviše slaba da može nametnuti samo upravljanje. Zbog toga se u prvim fazama socijalizma država pojavljuje kao snaga iznad radničke klase i društva sa svim protivrečnostima. Zbog toga je morao nastati jedan veoma samostalan upravljački sloj, politički veoma snažan, koji je mogao bitno da utiče na regulisanje unutrašnjih društvenih odnosa i suprotnosti. Usle takve političke moći, taj sloj može doći i dolazi u sukop sa osnovnom masom radničke klase ili sa pojedinim njenim delovima. That, I think, nobody in USSR would have ever said. Uh, or any other so-called socialist country. But, on the other hand, the same text goes on to claim the bureaucracy is not a class. Though, what I just read to you, taj veoma snažan politički samostalan upravljački sloj, I don't know what else might it would be called. And he concludes, ali zbog takvog svog položaja, birokratija u profesionalnom smislu ne postaje ona nova klasa koja je glavna prepreka društvenom utjecaju radničke klase. And I shall talk about this more tomorrow. Uh, this is a pattern which Bart would have called petit bourgeois nihilism, ni l'un ni l'autre. Uh, but we may more prettily call an Aristotelian middle path. So yes, on the other hand, hmm? but on the other hand, hmm. <laughs> Again, Kandel lucidly and un unsparingly identified the reforms with successes and failures. He was very frank. I re I'm really impressed by Kandel. Uh, the, the reform, reforma je nanela težak udera zdravno birokratskom centralizmu time što je ukinula federalne investicijone fondove i oključila celokupnu proširenu reprodukciju sistem samoupravnog društvenog rada. Ali je ostavila neka bitna pitanja što je omogućilo tehno-birokratski usmjerenim delovima političke strukture u republikama da zadrže veliku snagu u raspolaganju društvenim kapitalom. 
čak priznaje, so se njihove mogočnosti povečale preko kreditnog in bankarskog sistema, vele trgovine in sl. Ranja borba za razpodelo v akumulacije među republikama sada se vodi kao konkurencija banaka trgovine privrednih organizacija. To je ekonomski osnov za povezivanje naše privredne tehnostrukture sa buržuarskim nacionalizmom Veri Kardelj, to je 74. posle smenjivanja rukovodstva partije v Hrvatskoj Srbiji zbog navodnog nacionalizma, koji inače, mislim, v Hrvatskoj je zbilja postojal. So, you have here a system where every 10 or 12 years you have to explain how come that this wonderful thing which we said within a hand's grasp has not arrived. Well, because we didn't think of the banks, well, what were you doing? You see what I mean? So, the 19, we didn't have time to bring Nismo uspeli na vrijeme donesti novi koncept društvenog planiranja dobrim delom zbog nesuglasicu u Savjezu komunista. Again, anonymous. A sjetite se, remember that the 1960s are the beginning of the slowing down of the international economic boom, that is to say the beginning of the crisis of fordistic capitalism. If you have read the interview with Mochnik with Pupovec, he has some very interesting things to say about that. So, for the in a paper for the Second Congress of Self Managers in '71, Kardel began talking about the first time, for the first time, not only about conflict but also about capital, if not clearly or fully. He defined the state capital. Državni kapital je deo društvene akumulacije koji je sve do šezdesetpete država usmeravala u centralne investicijone fondove. Zakon od 71. dakle čekali su šest godina nakon reforme, državni kapital na nivou federacije u bivšim savjeznim bankama prenesen na republike i pokrajine. A u članku 74. koji sam vam prije citirao, kada je zaključio, nastali su, citiram, određeni oblici, to on stavljao navodnike, kapital odnosa koji su vršili utjecaj na društvo i SKJ. Ali ne možemo se vrati na jedan od najopasnijih oblika kapitala, odnosa koji je bio socijalistička, opet u navodnim znakovima, prvobitna akumulacija zasnovana na prostom otimanju dohodka od radnika na osnovu administrativnih akata, to jest na stalinizam, ne možemo se vratiti. Strašno logično to nije, jel? Nasto je kapitalizam, ali mi se ne možemo vratiti na stalinizam, jel? za A treće, mislim treće je on. Conclusion. As can be seen, if you allow me to bring in some semiotics and narratology, all these actants are collectively impersonal. There are no class actors or agents, only abstract socio-economic allegorical entities. The state, the capital, which is also socialist capital, the undifferentiated working people and the techno-bureaucratic structure into which resources pour as if by a river in flood. Nobody knows who gives the resources, who takes their no faces. It's faceless structuralism run mad. Marx would have said, Monsieur le socialisme, Madame la relation du capital et Madame la technostructure, if you remember his famous uh, satire in the capital. Now, finally, uh, how much time do we have? Um, enough. Okay. I mean, Finally, half an I will... Uh, hmm? Half an hour more at least. No, no, I will finish before half an hour. <laughs> I will finish uh, with a kind of uh, uh, mixture between talking about uh, data, what happened, and my own uh, views. Uh, it is called associational and citizen democracy or collapse. We begins, uh, it begins with economics. <laughs> And uh, if one skips entirely relationships with other countries, which I must do for analytical convenience, the crucial economic or political pro problem after about 56 in Yugoslavia was twofold. First, who decided about division of the surplus value earned in production? Uh, 
the part taxed away and then distributed by the state was at the beginning the measure of the balance between elements of etatism and self-management in a society. And after 65, it remained the measure of bureaucratic seizure of capital. The results of the crucial 65 reform were ambiguous and finally unsatisfactory. The field of decision making by enterprises and workers' councils was enlarged. But lacking state guidance, the necessity of mesoeconomic mergers and other vertical cooperation fell under the sway of banks and analogous, uncontrolled and alienated centers of financial powers. This, in fact, removed the centers of decision further from the workforce. Without clear lines of political democracy to determine delegation from below and without competing programs based on open information flows. But then second, who produced the surplus value? Okay, we're talking about division. Peasants allowed a maximum of 10 hectares, as a rule fed the country but otherwise contributed very little. This is a totally unresolved problem in Yugoslavia, political economical problem of the peasants. I'm not competent to decide whether uh, what I'm going to talk about next time tomorrow about the middle classes, whether they con contributed anything. Certainly within them, the engineers, educators, health workers and so on, there would have been much smaller circles. So, peasants, middle classes, I shall however focus only on manual workers. The self-management system from 1950 on recognized only workers employed in production units. That is to say, neither all working people, which would have been unemployed women and peasants too, nor uh, the worker, wor working class as such. Okay? In the Radni Odnos, or long-term enterprise, they, the, the, the system recognized only people in the Radni Odnos. That is to say, long-term employment at enterprises were work with workers' councils. They had all the rights and all the duties. The system no longer recognized unpropertied wage earners, either as a class or as a status. The concept of labor as an actor separate from capital ceased to exist. <coughs> this is what I call bad utopianism, you see. Uh, instead, uh, the system, as explained by Harry everybody else, proclaimed as the economic core idea of self-management, and I quote, to increase gain within a single budgetary autonomous enterprise or unit by cutting costs of production so that income rose in proportion to real gains in productivity. What happened to both the not permanently employed male workers and the female domestic work, that is somewhere near to half, in my opinion, of the manual workers, as I read the imperfect statistics. This was never apparently touched upon by Yugoslav political theory. Although both these mega groups were a kind of super exploited subproletariat, uh, the precari, as they say in Italy, uh, and the women, which loomed in the background as a potential economic threat both to the fully employed workforce and political threat to democracy or socialism in general you could mobilize the unemployed workers for anything that you pay them to do. Instead, uh, the Yugoslav debates about 58 to 75 focused on creating solid economic foundations for self-management on the enterprise level. So, increasing the proportion left at the disposal of workers' councils, presumably later to be handled by their higher forms of association, the Vieća Proizvodjača, the in interest in Zajnitz and so on. But that proportion seems to have oscillated with one third with peaks up to one half, uh, the proportion at the disposal of the direct producers. When it came to one, one half, the ruling class got seriously worried and pushed it back to one third again. Uh, this was the conclusion arrived at without my ruling class, okay, by Kardel and one assumes the Politburo by the early 60s. But they were unable to enforce it, to increase the proportion. In other words, the autonomy of scattered working enterprises proved insufficient to bring about, about a deeper change that would solidify the social system. So where could we theoretically get this deeper change? I get to public information. 
the theme of economic and psychological alienation in Yugoslavia and, and the theme of efficiency intertwine here as a deep double helix. But the former theme, the, the alienation, has been well pioneered by the Praxis group, and you can read it all there in uh, Gajo Petrovic, Mihailo Markovic, Vranitsky and company. So let me start from hard-nosed economics. The cardinal condition for efficiency and optimization in socialist na national economy is the availability of a number of variants which enter the lists on equal terms and are defended in good faith in the process of choice. This means free flow of information to and from the central decision-making body. Now, democracy in the sense that everybody has a voice and the right to participate in the affairs in the community is the official ideology of socialist social integration and was one of the basis of the regime's legitimacy. It has not only a rational basis as the core of self-management, but it, it is also indispensable in efficiently passing to work with a computerized and rapidly changing technology, free flow of information and so on. Yet, just as in capitalism, and sometimes even more so, regimes pretending to override harmony, as the Chinese say today, find it particularly easy to restrict and manipulate information flows, disallowing a possible public sphere. The denial of the right to defend the position before and after the decision is taken, and all the more so the exclusion of all forms of appeal to public opinion and manifestation of social pressure, has far-reaching negative effects on the effectiveness of the actions taken, is the conclusion by Bruce. He's totally right, I think. Uh, had such a public sphere, which would involve the drawing of personal conclusions, that is to say, new people to rule, and the possibility of changing programs and on the basis of results, had such a public sphere come about, then small independent groups inside and outside the League of Communists, no longer shackled by the facade of unanimity, could have begun to articulate seemingly abstruse, but in reality central questions. There were many such questions, I will mention only three. What is work and production? So what is distribution according to work, which was the key slogan? In Marxism, dependent work is best a necessary evil, and the in dialectically demands the right of, for, uh, for creative laziness too. It was a famous booklet written by Marx's son-in-law on the right to laziness. No, he was French. Uh, what is productivity? Only capitalist surplus for labor or all creativity? Brecht said one can produce chairs and love. This was never even thought of. Uh, productivity was strict Ricardo and Adam Smith. Okay? At the same cost, you produce 15 instead of 12 pieces. That's productivity. It doesn't solve all the questions. Number two, what is the socio-political role and psychological fallout of commodity production and the capital relation, as Cartwright calls it? And if these have been inevitable, as is probable, what were? Now, A, the limits of their duration on the road come to communism, and B, the Keynesian and Marxian ways of correcting them immediately while they lasted towards class and citizen solidarity, towards indispensable and already existing elements of distribution according to need, as Marx said, which were existing, of course, the health insurance and so on, the pensions, you know, but nobody theorized them, okay? In, in other words, if we can have general health insurance without any relation to how much you produce, why not B, C, D also? You see, this is A. Number four, uh, sorry, uh, number three. Assuming that fundamental macroeconomic planning about the direction of social development remains indispensable in socialism, how and by whom should it be done? How tested and debated, and how should it use and limit the market? The market has never been in capitalism without limits and guidance. This is uh, ideological nonsense. Can the federal level be totally emasculated without eventually losing the state? How much decision power must there be left in a state for it to remain a state? All of this was 
to my mind, except maybe in the 80s, which I haven't investigated, not debated, and then it was too late. In particular, within the doctrine of, let me call it, so, uh, atomic self-management, in which individual enterprises are not within a clear system of rules, its function is reduced to maximization of net income per employee. But any economist will tell you, and Branko Horvath did, this tends to lower the levels of output and employment and to demand higher capital investment. <coughs> now, the situation in Yugoslavia is that we had little capital, but a lot of laborers wanting, wanting to work. So, to steer the economic system towards the necessity for higher capital investment means you are going to get trouble. Thus, time and again, the central authorities had to return to direct management instruments. Abolish all these reforms. For this moment, we have to do so and so. Price freezes, regulation of personal incomes, regulation of foreign currency earnings, and so on. These interventions did not stem from the system, but from ad hoc treatments of acutely inflamed conditions. So they could not be effective. The doctrine con contradicted objective needs and possibilities. And then I have here a long discussion of uh, socialist politics in, uh, because, uh, in relationship to democracy, because I think what was needed for a true socialization of the means of production was to realize a vertical build-up of self-management, which Carter also theorized. <coughs> uh, in other words, I would say not depolitization of the economy, but democratization of politics. Due to the deadlock of the party, this was attempted in a half-hearted and inefficient way and therefore failed. My hypothesis is that what the political backers of self-management lacked, that is to say, a part of the ruling uh, League of Communists and most of the humanist intelligentsia and a little part of the working class, what they lacked is against the new ruling class of bureaucracy and or technocracy, and I'll speak about this more tomorrow, but nobody knows what it really should be called. Uh, what they lacked was the embattled pressure from the plebeian groups <coughs> of the working class and other citizens. And this pressure could only have become effective if real organization, including fair access to media, was allowed to all political groups uh, vetted as conforming to the socialist constitution. Okay? Not to the enemies of uh, um, refusal of private capitalism and so on. Yeah. So, how could this be done? As you know, uh, if you have um, discussed democracy, the genus democracy divides into three main species. Representative democracy, which is parliamentary, which is the one we have now, unless we have uh, military dictators. Associational democracy and direct democracy. Uh, Associational democracy is, of course, less touted as an ideology than a representative, but at least as important. And it's so important that it exists even inside representative democracy, uh, in labor unions, in cooperatives, or business associations, which directly engage in aspects of political decision making through involvement in government commissions, various corporatist forms, uh, representation of regulatory agencies, and so on. But of course, their contribution to democracy in the interests of majority depends on the internal democracy of these associations themselves, the labor unions, the cooperatives, the business associations. So, so we come back to direct democracy, which is actually both Marx's and Lenin's fundamental idea, where citizens are directly involved in the activities of political governments not so much by plebiscite or referendum, which is known in bourgeois democracy too. Once in so many years you vote whether minarets should be built in Switzerland or not. Okay. Uh, but the permanent form of uh, direct democracy, uh, popular empower empowerment such as was begun in Narodno Slobodi Lački in 1941. This is the revolutionary democratic idea of the Soviets, common to all popular uprisings from time immemorial, 
through the Soviets of Trotsky and Lenin to the present day to Hungary in 56 and Argentina in 98 or whatever it was and so on. Associational democracy in Yugoslavia would have been a return to the best of Lenin in 1918, and I quote, every citizen to a man must act as a judge and participate in the government of the country. Socialism cannot be introduced by a minority, a party. Well, he said this in 1918, then he got a civil war of three years and had to stay alive and change and so on. But uh, the le we have this legacy where Lenin and Luxembourg actually meet, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and within such a system, in my opinion, a party with the huge achievements and prestige of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, not, not to mention its resources and control of the armed forces, would have still retained a preponderant voice. But it would have had to explain its inner workings. It would have ruled by the power of political hegemony Rather, rather than by any kind of police repression. Uh, for the vanguard nature of the party to become more than a self-accolade, the decisive test would be, of course, permitting free and open dissent to all its member and uh, basic organizations, that is to say, the existence of what in Leninist language was called fractions and which existed in every social and communist party up to 1921, when Lenin concluded it should be forbidden for one year. But then he got sick and it was never unforbidden, so to speak. And my fourth conclusion, and with this I come to a conclusion, is that Marx's key tenet of introducing transparency into societal relations would have in Yugoslav politics meant breaching two huge mystifications about the extortion of surplus value and about the need of for party monopoly on information and policy. Neither of them was realized. So one logically suspects they were interdependent. The economic debate and the political debate. What are then the pointers towards a conclusion? I have two interlocking conclusions. Cognitively, there was a serious lack of empirical analysis of political stratification, blocked by the non-transparency of party centers, and the failure to elucidate fundamental th theoretical problems of socialist society, crucially economic philosophy and methodology, due to the unwillingness of acknowledging diverging class interests inside the Communist Party. Remember that by 1964 it had one million members. It had nothing to do with Lenin's Communist Party except its desire to be the strong ruler. Okay. Politically, my conclusion is uh, the same one as Bruce, one of the best and most sympathetic outside observers. Where decentralization and worker self-management at, at enterprise level are not followed by democratization at the center, the tendencies towards disintegration increase. He wrote this in 1970. Huh? Beyond the obvious historical, historical failure of SFRY, did the experiment of self-management itself succeed? It showed much promise at the beginning. However, uh, I agree with Cardell, and I quote, that the essence of self-management is that the worker should simultaneously work and fulfill those functions which were in capitalist society exercised by the capitalist and in ethicist society by the state. Okay, this I got the citation from Kershevan, you remember. In that sense, self-management failed definitively sometime after 65. 65, much before foreign pressure, popular disaffection, and ruling class sycophancy doomed the state. I also have two parting considerations. First, about Kardel, and the second, about my own, if I can quote Bloch and call it concrete utopianism about introducing democracy into self management and so on. What strikes me after absorbing much Kardel is his lack of any feeling for an intimate and spontaneous contradictoriness of every process essential in Marx and the mature Lenin, I mean, after 1914. 
In, plus, in place of dialectics, Kardec's discourse enumerates thoroughly and most conscientiously, even pedantically, elements divided into positive and negative. This is the procedure of bourgeois positivism, possibly with traces of Austro-Marxism like Bauer's. Against the horizon of irresistible progress in spite of obstacles, per aspera ad astra. It is certainly superior to Stalin's theological deductiveness, but it cannot deal with sudden jumps and turn turnabouts. Except in the starry moment of the partisan struggle and the Narno-Slobodilacki outbury in the war. The discourse finally comes to rest in rather heavy, repetitive, often wooden constructions with an insufficient basis in quickly shifting reality. The epistemological revolution after World War II, pioneered before that time so that temporarily Carter could read it, you know, um, in physicists after Einstein and in Marxist heretics like Korsh, the young Lukács or Benjamin, this passed Carter totally by. <coughs> As to the political mentions I me measured in a concrete utopianism of the previous section, would all of them really have increased productivity to the point of supporting most of the 13 million potential active people and their families at a decent living standard? And would such increase have allowed Yugoslav com commodities to compete on the world market rather than being mostly restricted to second and third world markets as a kind of westernmost third world country? For such answers, we would need a new Branko Horvat, which I am not, and thus I cannot give it. I can only say that I don't know whether they would have been, with them, it would have been enough to save Yugoslavia. I can say that without them, without the precondition of transparency and democracy, the basis for popular support to tough economic and political decisions, indispensable but never taken, such as kicking out half of the ruling people or whatever, would not be there. Had it been there and had the Yugoslav system allowed the stymied subjective force forces inside the citizenry and the party to use them, I believe, without any real evidence, there would have been a chance to continue a federative and at least vaguely welfare state Yugoslavia. Thank you. Uh, Zdaj, kot pa navadno odpiram razpravo, če imam to kakšno vprašanje, komentarje, mislim, da imam... Ja, imamo še kar dost časa, tako da... Možete na slovenskom, ali ako ste jako teoretični, onda bolje na englesko. In jasno in polako, kako je rekla gospoda. Ja, ko nije jasno in polako, ne bom razumel. Če bi pa nekaj res začel, če mogoče, da se publika v Bogum. Kar se tiče recimo tega povdarka na produktivnosti, ali pa recimo, kako bi rekel, te vzpoglednosti jugoslovanskih politikov pa ekonomistov, je mogoče še en element, ki ga je dobro upoštevati, da je Jugoslavija tako kot vse socialistične države, ni bila industrijska država pred revolucijo, sprav šele z revolucijo se je začeli vzpostavljali moderne industrijske baze, za kar v sami marxistični literaturi ni bilo za dost materijala, se pravi. Bil je recimo materijal, kako bi recimo zgledal, ne vem, delovski svet in tako naprej, v neki razviti industrijski državi, ni bilo pa recimo literature, niti teorije, niti recimo pravi materijala, kaj narej, če imaš neko zaostalo gradno polkolonijalno državo, kjer je bila del Avstro-Ugrska imperija še 20 let, dobri 20 let, 30 let. Da ne govorimo o Turskoj. Ja. In mislim, da je tukaj tudi odgovor, zakaj je bil recimo Lenin navdušen nad terorizmom, ne? In zakaj so se recimo, to smo včeri na predavanju Bogomirja Kovača poslušali, 
Zakaj, zakaj so se recimo te vzhodni ekonomisti obračali v Ameriko hodili? Vsebi jugoslovanski, ki so lahko hodili v Ameriko študirati, brali neoklasične ekonomiste, ker dejansko ta, ta so bili koncepti operativne teorije, kako štartati industrijo mrte in ker tega v, v marksistični um, literaturi ni bilo in mogoče je to tudi en razlog, kaj ta podarenje produktivnosti. Tako nabere, ker so pač brali so zahodne učbenike in tam je bilo to ključno. Um, in mogoče iz tega izvira tudi ta, ta dost stroga delitev dela v samem intelektualnem polju v Jugoslaviji, uh, kjer je večina marksizma se proizvajala v filozofiji in so imeli uh, večinoma filozofske tematike, se so zanimale... Alienacija. Se, ja, alienacija, uh, človek, osebnost, človeškost. In tako naprej med tem, ki so ekonomisti, so sicer prebrali, kapital, ampak uh, ga pa niso ravno aplicirali, so se pa obračali, uh, kar recimo ameriški, no, te, mogoče je čist ena dimenzija. No. Vse da govorim na, na engleskom ili na hrvatsko? Kako že? <laughs> hrvatsko. Ok. To je, to je sasvim točno. Uh, kasnije, v prvom redu, ima ta prokleta, kako da kažem, to je, to je genevska genetski problem leninizma, to je taj problem, ta inzistencija na tajnosti, ne? ko je razumljiva pod carizmom i za vreme revolucije pod nacizmom kragu. Ne? Ali bilo je u stvari puno diskusija 20. i 30. godina koje su sve bile zabranjene. Bila jedna fina teorija trockista preobraženstva koji je bio jedan od glavnih planera o socijalističkoj primitivnoj akumulaciji. To jest, ako vi kažete, u marksizmu nema e, elemenata e, za izgradnju industrije, kako da ima, to je kapital, ne. A to je kapitalistička primitivna akumulacija, što znači mizeriju i, i, i u, a, ubistvo pola radnog naroda, ne, od, od 1520. pa do 1880. ne, jer je pola Škotske je pomrlo od gladi, pola Irske je pomrlo od gladi, pola Engleske je otišlo u Ameriku, ne? I na toj bazi, a drugi su morali šutiti i raditi 16 sati, plus žene i djecu, na toj bazi se industrija može izgraditi. Na toj bazi nećemo. Dakle, ima negativna folija. E sad, kako ćemo raditi socijalističku prvobitnu akumulaciju? Preobraženci i trockisti su rekli na bazi seljaka. Ne, mi ćemo eksploatirati seljake da bi smo mogli izgraditi. Stalin je rekao, to je užas, vi ste protiv naroda, ali napravili je to isto, samo nije htio priznati. Stalinova teorija je pola Trotski, pola Buharin. Plus teološki seminar u Tiflicu, kao forma. Ne? Onda je bio jedan vrlo interesantna knjiga publicirana u 1930. godinama od Oskara Langlija, koji je bio poljski komunista zajedno s jednim englesom. Ne znam zašto ga je zajedno pisao, ali da, da ga izdao u, u, o e, ekonomskim problemima socijalizma. I onda zbilja ništa. Javni Kidrić ne, morao je tražiti e, e, gde god je uspio. Ne? Kidrić je bio student u Pragu, i onda je išao u Rusiju posle rata. Što je išao u Rusiju, to je samo žali Bože, ne samo u gluposti mogu čuti. A, ovaj, a što je u Pragu, on imao vremena kao polu ilegalac da, da čita, to ja ne znam. Ali on je bio stvarno talent, Kitić je bio genije, o tom nema sumnje. Valjda organizacijoni isto u oslobodilnoj fronti, to ja ne znam dosta, ali kao ekonomista, to je sad, on je za, za vreme tih par godina prije nek što je umro, strašno puno toga kapirao. Ali ima tu stvar, mislim, marksizam nije dobra baza za izgradnju socijalizma u jednoj zaostaloj zemlji samoj. Jugoslavija je stvarno pokušala jedina o Stalinovu parolu, to je zgrna socijalizma u jednoj zemlji. Ono što je Stalin gravio je bio hidraulički diktatura, ne, a ne socijalizam. No, da je recimo frtal socijalizam i tri frtal diktatura. A ovo kod nas je bilo tri frtal socijalizma i frtal diktature. To je bio stvarni pokušaj i ja sam impresioniran e, e, s druge strane ima, ima u 
komunističkim partijama također, ne samo lingvističkim i socijaldemokratskim isto, strašno nepovjerenje prema intelektualcima koje ima dobre baze, ok, ima sociološki dobre baze, ali politički vrlo glupo. Jer mi smo imali vrhunske ekonomiste i intelektualci jednog Branka Horvata. Oni su njega izbacili sa položaja šefa ne znam čega, ekonomskog instituta, on je bio glavni planer, ne, u Beogradu. Oni su ga skinuli, Savjezno izvršno vječe, jer im je rekao, taj vaš plan ne može funkcionirati. A zašto su taj plan donijeli? Jer je to bio kompromis između kardelja i onih anonimnih raznih salaja ili kaja znam. Za salaja slučajno znamo, jer se on toliko bunio protiv radničkih savjeta, da mu je Tito morao narediti da napiše pismo zajedno s Kidrićem 49. o uvođenju radničkih savjeta, bio šef sindikata. Dakle, za njega slučajno znamo, to je anegdotika, ali koje su to stvarno bile snage, ja mislim da je to su bile sve one snage koje su bile došle iz nižih klasa i zauzile vrhovske partijske položaje odmah ispod centralnog komiteta. To bi trebalo napraviti fine neke doktorate o tome. Ima li tu uopće rešenja, to jest u najpovoljnim uslovima? Mi smo imali relativno najpovoljnije uslove. Puno para do 1970. relativno, na račun žena i nezaposlenih radnika, ok, ali relativno imali smo pametne ljude kao kardelja koji je sam morao stvarati nekakvu teoriju, a teoretičar bil nije, kao glava teoretičke, koji mislim kao za razliku od Kidrića koji je. On je bio odlični, savjesni, kako da kažem, on bi bio odličan šef Simensa, recimo, birokracije Simensa, kardeli. Date mi te elemente, a ja vam izgradim sve te planove. Jednog velikog poduzeća. Onda imaš protiv tebe sve te nekakve bošance i crnogorce i šta ja znam a Hrvati pak vele da im previše para uzimaš da o Slovencima ne govorim. I tu je nastao jedan impas i kako bi se tu van, ali mislim, teoretski govoreći izlaz iz toga je otvoreno društvo. Dobro, svaka se država, svaka se država brani protiv subverzije. FBI je poubijao sa pištoljima cijelu Black Panther, od prvog do zadnjeg. Ne? Svaka se država brani, to se zna. Ako si ti protiv ustava te zemlje, mi ćemo te progoniti. Ali unutar toga, ne, pusti ljude da imaju svoje grupe, da naprave nekakav plan, jer poslije druge reforme možda ćeš ti trebati taj plan. Sad veliš da je strašno, a to što je. Tako da, tu nije bilo zlo namjernosti, ja mislim. Namjere Kardelja i kompanije su bile divne, prekrasne, kao sreće da ih imamo danas. Sreća za sve odmah, to je parola. Uzimam to iz jednog science fictiona, sad sve jedno. To bi mogla biti parola Kardelja. Ali, da ja kažem da je sljedećih 30 drugova koji su moji partizanski Pajdaši, danas su neprijatelji naroda, to se ne može. To je raskol u partiji, to je propast. E, ali onda propast dođe drugče, ako to ne napravi. Še kažno vprašanje? Dobro, če ne, bi se jaz tako še enkrat najljem zahvalil. Jaz sem da bomo še iz centralnega komiteja štir točke, kaj vse še moram povedati. Najprej bi se rad zahvalil Sofiji za soorganizacijo in pač to, da so profesor Jesovina pripeljali v Ljubljano. Zaprav se zahvalijo in Sofiji in Matjažu za vse to. Potem bi vas pred povabil še na ostale dogodke, kjer bo tudi Darko Sovin nastopil, sicer jutr ob 11. je na Filofaksu predstavitev njegove knjige, katere prevodja ravno kar tudi šel pri založbi Sofija. In potem ob 6. je pod Trubar je vehiši to obličenje magistrata še predavanje v okviru Kroška DPU samoupravljanje. 
tako da vabljeni na oboji litere. Naslednji četrtek v bistvenem času na istem kraju pa predava Mislav Žitko, bratran sicer bolj znana je Dade Žitko, ampak ima tudi sam nekaj referenc, med drugim je že dolgoletni absolvent kroatistike in filozofije, predal bo pa o financializaciji gospodinstva s pomočjo Marksa in Minskega in pa odzadi lahko kupite zbornike DPU, med njimi tudi izgubljeni in ponovno najdemi zbornik v posvrdizmu. Hvala. Kaj je vaša reposnost? Aha, kdo je da držina? Aha, to je bolj znana sestrična od gledališka igralka in književnica. A to je? Tudi je. Pak po tretji zitre. Hvala še enkrat. Hvala vam. Razredni boj po razrednem boju. 14-letnik Delavsko-Pankarske univerze. Predavanja vsak četrtak ob 18. uri v klubu Gromka na Metelkovi.